Now, today, when we see these devices on the mobile platform out there, or when new ones come out, we have this tendency, hopefully, from a hacker's perspective, we're thinking, what am I going to do now? One of my favorite quotes comes from Master Yoda, who says, size matters not. Look at me. Judge me by my size, do you? <laughs> terrible, terrible impression, I doubt. But it's the same concept here with mobile devices. They're extremely small. Most of our smartphones are more powerful than the computing systems that we use to get a man on the moon. The rate at which mobile devices are coming out and the applications being supported on these devices is mind boggling. So buckle up. I'm going to take you through several different aspects of the mobile platform from a hacker's perspective. Let's get started with identifying what the experts of cybersecurity feel are the top 10 risks of mobile devices. And by experts, I mean OWASP which is short for the Open Web Application Security Project, publishes a top 10 risks for all kinds of things, one of them being mobile devices. The M that you'll see in these numbers, of course, results or refers to mobile. And the list is pretty similar to the OWASP's top 10 web application risks. These top 10 were finalized and published in 2016. By the way, sidebar here, OWASP is a fantastic resource for you to follow and to learn from. First, we have M1, which is improper platform usage. This category relates to the violation of the platform's functionality or failure to use security features. It might be any Android platform permission, touch ID misuse, a uh, keychain, or some other mobile security system feature that we don't utilize or configure correctly. M2 is insecure data storage. There's a trade-off with supporting offline functionality and developers must carefully consider which data will be stored on mobile devices and how it will be stored. A mobile application should avoid storing sensitive information on the local file system if possible as it could actually lead to an attacker gaining access after some physical acquisition of the device. We then have M3, insecure communications. Mobile applications should avoid using non-secure communication methods. Can you think of a couple that we've talked about through this series? Because it could result in attackers being able to sniff or manipulate transmitted data. This would include HTTP, FTP, Telnet, WAP, and GPRS. There are often cases where HTTPS connections can't be established due to a certificate validation failure, meaning self-signed certificates may be used. And in this case, a developer may choose to accept the risk of disabling HTTPS validation. Let's just make sure the developer is the one in charge of choosing to accept that risk. We also have M4, which is insecure authentication. Mobile apps should always implement secure authentication methods. And this includes OAuth 2.0 wherever possible, as well as implementing strong passwords or pin policies to lock a device after a few failed attempts or even wiping the device. An application that supports SSO should only do so with trusted sources that adhere to security best practices. We then have M5, insufficient cryptography. Mobile apps should always use standard cryptographic algorithms and implementations. Listen, using weak cryptography increases the risk of data breaches, whether it's intended or not. We then have M6, which is our insecure authorization. Insecure authorization exposes data. It allows attackers to perform actions as authenticated users and facilitates attacks such as insecure direct object reference. We then have M7, which is our client code quality. Mobile app client code should never be trusted. Malicious mobile apps can easily exploit the client side vulnerabilities by modifying how applications function using reflection, changing the flow of uh, execution, injecting commands into the command stream, or even executing native machine code. And developers really need to verify that the mobile 
app clients are valid before we accept them. We then have M8, which is our code tampering. Malicious mobile apps can leverage dynamic code loading to tamper with the original app. Several commercial and open source dynamic code loading frameworks are commonly used for legitimate purposes. But unfortunately, that leaves developers vulnerable to abuse because, hey, attackers can use the same frameworks. Looking for vulnerabilities within those frameworks, as well as uh, the dynamic code that's out there, Again, attackers are going to find a way in. We also have M9, which is our reverse engineering. Mobile apps, yep, just like almost everything else we've talked about in this series, can be reverse engineered using automated tools or manually by examining the application binaries after decompiling. Then we have M10, our extraneous functionality. An attacker can download and inspect the mobile app in their own environment. And we're gonna go through and look at log files and configuration files, and possibly even dive into the binary itself to see whether there are any hidden switches or test code that was left behind by developers. We will utilize these switches and convert functions on the backend systems to execute an assault. Well, that's the top 10 list. Pretty good one, huh? Because businesses have embraced what we refer to as BYOD or bring your own device, uh, bring your own disaster <laughs> policy, mobile devices have become a major target for attacks. These machines are checked for vulnerabilities by attackers. The device and the network layer, the data center, or a mix of them can all be attacked. Attackers exploit vulnerabilities associated with the following to launch malicious attacks. First, we have the device. At this level, attackers go after several different components, like various browser-based attacks, including phishing, which we've already covered in this series. But there's also something called clickjack. This is also known as a user interface redress attack. It's a way of tricking web users to click on something different than what they actually think it is. We also have buffer overflows. Again, we've talked about this in this series, but the concept here is writing data to overflow the buffer that the application has reserved. And the result can include some really interesting results. And then we have the man in the mobile attack. I know what you're thinking. That looks like man in the middle, Dale. It's very close. The attacker implants code into the victim's phone or their device to bypass password verification systems that we usually see that send one-time passwords or an SMS message to validate that the credentials are correct. And by doing this type of an attack, the attacker is able to get those email messages or text messages. Overall concept here is just know that these types of attacks are possible from the browser level. We then have the phone and SMS based attacks on a device. These would include smishing, which is basically just phishing via text message and baseband attacks. Again, this is where an attacker is just going to go after your phone's baseband processor, which is in charge of connecting you to your cell towers. Now, what else do we use on a device that could be attacked? Yep, things like apps, right? Applications, where the app stores data on your device, if it's encrypted or not encrypted, misconfigurations, permission issues, and even manipulating the runtime of an application can cause us some problems. Oh, you know what? Let's not forget the OS itself. Talk about a plethora of issues. Things like routing and jailbreaking, no passcodes, weak passcodes, the data that's cached on the device, the software that comes pre-installed on your device from your vendor, GPS spoofing, and the list goes on and on for the device itself. Then we have to worry about the networking technologies, right? All the Wi-Fi weaknesses that we talked about in our ethical hacking, hacking wireless networks course here at Pluralsight. Things like rogue access points, weak encryption, sniffing, man in the middle attacks, DNS poisoning, session hijacking, you know, that big long list we talked about. Then we have the data center and cloud level to worry about. Things like web server based attacks, like vulnerabilities of a platform or misconfigurations, uh, cross site scripts, brute force attacks, even weak input validation. Are you overwhelmed yet? How about database attacks that could be vulnerable? Yeah, it's really overwhelming, which is exactly 
what has gotten the attacker's attention with mobile devices. Thank you.